Oh, hey, didn't see you there. Yeah, I'm just enjoying a lovely day and a sip from one of my favorite beverages. Oh, tonic water. Now, the substance that gives tonic water its characteristic flavor is a compound called quinine. And there's actually a pretty interesting story behind quinine. Actually, it's not so much interesting as it is long. Quinine is a compound isolated from the bark of the chinchona tree, or at least was first isolated from the bark of the chinchona tree, a tree native to regions of South America, specifically around Peru. And the chinchona tree itself has a pretty interesting story. The name, the genus, of the chinchona tree came from Carolus Linnaeus, the individual who came up with our binomial system of nomenclature for naming living things the binomial or two-name system by which we identify ourselves as, let's say, Homo sapiens, or the family dog as Canis familiaris. So he named it after a diplomat in the region uh, who first identified, at least publicly, the medicinal properties of the chinchona bark. And some of those medicinal properties not only included pain-killing properties, but also anti-malarial properties. And so these anti-malarial properties were then delivered to uh, subjects that were in the British colonies where malaria was a concern in the form of a tonic or tonic water. Now this tonic water had a bitter flavor to it so they tried to spice it up a little bit by adding gin and hence the drink gin and tonic came out of that uh, region and that use. Now the quinine concentrations that we have in tonic these days are significantly less than they were back in the day where it was actually used for anti-malarial. But it still is an interesting story, and it does explain why tonic water has the bitter flavor it does, because quinine itself is a base. In fact, it's a weak base. Now, why are we talking about weak bases? Well, you'll see. Mm. <laughs> Now, in the previous vodcast, we talked about strong acids versus weak acids. In this particular vodcast, we're going to take a look at strong bases versus weak bases, and then we're going to tie all of these constants that we've discussed so far together and take a look at how KW, KA, and KB are related. But first, let's take a look at strong bases and what makes a base strong. Now, remember that with molecular compounds, they dissolve, and if those molecular compounds are acidic, they will further dissociate in a process called ionization. Now bases, especially if they're strong bases, will dissociate completely. That is, as soon as they come in contact with water or are solvated by water, they form their component ions of the base. So we have a very high dissociation, we say 100%, so that when a base is taken into aqueous solution, we are going to get nothing but hydroxide ions and um, the uh, basic ion that's going to form out of that, or ultimately the conjugate acid of the base. So we are going to get nothing but hydroxide ions, 100%. So that if we're going through to calculate this, the concentration of the base is going to be equal to the concentration of the hydroxide ions. And this is what we classify as a strong base. That is, we have a really high concentration of hydroxide ions, and we have a very low pOH. Remember, the pOH is analogous to the pH scale, except instead of determining the power of hydrogen, we're determining the power of hydroxide. The lower the pOH, the more basic the solution. Now, how do we identify these str strong bases just based on their formula? Well, strong bases, we classify them as hydroxides of group 1 and 2, with beryllium often being an exception there. So things like common bases that we tend to think about in terms of strength, things like uh, sodium hydroxide and lithium hydroxide and calcium hydroxide, if soluble, would be considered a strong base. So what makes a weak base then? Well, everything else. So any other type of compound, like quinine, that's going to act as a base, if it doesn't fall into that first category of strong bases, is obviously then a weak base. The most common one, probably, that we are going to deal with at this point being ammonia. So a weak base has a really low KB, and that's due to this low dissociation. Similar to the weak acids that had a low ionization, these weak bases have a low dissociation. So this is where our equilibrium comes in, because very few of these molecules are actually going to dissociate into hydroxide ions. And if we take a look at another scenario in which we were to add base and it would become solvated by water, what we would see is that a lot of that base would remain and we would have very few hydroxide ions 
forming from there. So it's not just as easy in terms of calculating our pH as taking the concentration of the base and plugging it into the pH calculation or ultimately the pOH calculation and then establishing the pH from there. We have to use an equilibrium scenario. And similar to the Ka or the acid ionization constant, we have come up with the Kb. That is the base dissociation constant. You will notice again that we do not keep water in the denominator, even though it is one of the reactants, again, we say that water's uh, concentration is constant or it's factored into the constant Kb. And so ultimately, in order for us to establish the hydroxide ion concentration of a weak base, we're going to have to use this Kb relationship to establish the concentration of hydroxide and be able to calculate the pH or the pOH from there. Now it's the moment you've been waiting for. Let's put all of these constants together and see how they're interrelated. So let's take a look at Kw, Ka, and Kb. And in order to do that, we're going to take a look at a scenario of conjugate acids and conjugate bases in order to derive the relationship that exists between these. So let's just take a look at an example in which we have a weak acid, hydrofluoric acid, reacting in the presence of water to form hydronium ions and fluoride ions. And if we identify these as acids and bases and conjugate acids and conjugate bases, we can then further say, well, if we have this as our equilibrium relationship, we can establish the Ka. And again, water is left out of that Ka expression. Well, if we were to take the conjugate base and then further react it with water so that we could derive a Kb for this particular reaction, we would have a Kb derived that would look very much like this with the hydrogen fluoride and the hydroxide in the numerator and the fluoride ion in the denominator. Now, and humor me here, let's just say we were to take Ka and multiply it by Kb. And we put these two expressions together in order to do that. What we would notice is that some of the values in the numerator and some of the values in the denominator are going to be the same. That is, they will divide out to 1. And if we do that, what we're left with is the concentration of the hydronium ion times the concentration of the hydroxide ion. And what does that look like? Well, that looks like Kw. So, the relationship that we can get out of this is that Kw is equal to the product of the Ka and the Kb. Okay, big deal. Right? Well, it is kind of a big deal, because now that we understand the relationship between Kb, Ka, and Kw, if we want to figure out the Ka for the conjugate acid of a base, or if we want to figure out the Kb for the conjugate base of an acid, if at least we know one of those values, one of those Ka's or one of those Kb's, often in tables of values that we can look up, we can now establish the Ka or Kb of the conjugates. And that's going to become valuable to us as we move on through our studies of acid-base equilibrium. So hopefully this video gave you a little bit of insight into bases and how we identify strong bases versus weak bases, but also gave you an understanding of the base dissociation constant. And ultimately it's very similar to the acid ionization constant that we've already talked about. But at least we now have a relationship that we can establish between Ka, Kb, and Kw. And we also have a better understanding of quinine and where the idea of tonic water came from. Because you don't have enough knowledge crammed up here yet. And remember, knowledge is power. At least that's what I'm told. Thanks for watching. So if you're looking to watch this video again, or if you're looking for some additional videos on some of the chemistry topics you've been covering in class, take a look at our YouTube channel or follow us on Twitter. Thanks for watching.